We all enjoy a good mystery, but it might wear on our nerves if we don't figure out the truth in the end. The desire to categorize things and create order in our life and society is part of the human condition. We enjoy a little mystery because it piques our innate curiosity, but we also enjoy solving or explaining the mystery because the unknown is something to be dreaded and avoided. This desire to categorize and explain occurrences makes us feel more in control. So, what if I told you about a mile-long, centuries-old stone wall? Rocks, carefully arranged in a circle. Colossal images carved into the desert surface. For sure, you'd know what these landmarks are, right? Well, guess again. Instead of the Great Wall of China or Stonehenge, these are all ancient American ruins and landmarks. Although United States is a relative newcomer on the world stage, it has long been home to people who have left traces of their presence that are as mysterious as those found round the world. The Mystery of the Hemet Maze Stone, Hemet, California A strange symbol, known as the Hemet Maze Stone, can be found near the town of Hemet in Reinhardt Canyon in Southern California. It's a maze inside a square or rectangle made up of interconnecting rectilinear shapes that form a cyclic pattern of mazes. The overall design resembles a swastika, a symbol that has been utilized in Native American and Asian art for millennia before being linked with modern connotations. The figure's resemblance to a swastika is quickly noted, leading to vandalism in the 1930s when someone etched a Nazi insignia into the petroglyph. Archaeologists are unsure who created the drawing, or how old it is. The creator of the petroglyphs has been attributed to a number of different people, from an obscure indigenous Californian civilization to Chinese Buddhist monks. The possibilities are endless. Let's look at the two prominent explanations and assess them in the light of what archaeologists, historians, and other experts know about the artist who created the maze. The first and by far most disputed theory, the petroglyph is made by Chinese Buddhist monks or shipwrecked sailors. According to proponents of this theory, sections of the maze resemble interwoven swastikas forming a giant swastika-like sign. This is a common Buddhist symbol that represents eternity. This theory is influenced by suggestions that the Chinese reached the Americas before Columbus arrived to the island of Hispaniola. If any culture could have reached and established settlement in the Americas before the Europeans, it certainly could have been the Chinese. Chinese Admiral Zheng He led expeditions to Malaysia, Sumatra, India, and East Africa in the early 15th century. Some enthusiasts have speculated that the Chinese could have reached the Americas as a result. Former Navy commander Gavin Menzies has even produced a book titled 1421, the year China discovered America, implying that the Chinese admiral completed the voyage to America before the emperor halted his exploration mission and erased all evidence of the voyage. However, there are a few flaws in this theory. For starters, many historians dismiss it since it lacks actual proof, and Menses fails to reference authentic sources. Another issue is that there's no proof of pre-Columbian Chinese presence in California. There are no Chinese towns, no monastic ruins, nothing that suggests Chinese or Buddhist monk colonies. Moreover, while swastikas appear in Chinese Buddhist art, the Buddhist swastika shows little relation to the swastika-like figure on the Hemet Maze Stone. According to the second major explanation, the petroglyphs were made by indigenous Californians. This argument fits well with the traditional picture of Southern California history and is based on the parallels between the maze petroglyphs and other examples of rock art in Southern California. The petroglyph on the Hemet Maze Stone resembles Rancho Bernardo style rock art found in Riverside and San Diego counties. This design is characterized by a large number of rectilinear shapes made up of parallel lines that meet at right angles. In the Rancho Bernardo style, there are no figures, such as flora or animals, only abstract geometric shapes. The art 
like the Hemet Maze Stone, is mostly constructed out of lines and boxes. The Salton Sea, Palm Canyon, Travertine Point, Sunshine Summit, and Rancho Bernardo are just a few of the locations where this style of rock art may be found in Riverside and San Diego counties. The fact that archaeologists have yet to associate the art style to a distinct indigenous civilization is one flaw in this argument. The villages of Rancho Bernardo have been suggested by archaeologists as the source of the Rancho Bernardo style. Many specimens of Rancho Bernardo rock art may be discovered in the community's traditional region, but it can also be found in the Luciano, Juaneo, Cupeño, and Cauhia cultured domains in the north and east. According to rock art specialist and founding member of the American Rock Art Association, the art form may have originated in Kumayaye area and migrated north and east from there. However, he also suggests that it could have come from the desert and moved west and southward instead. Both of these ideas are not without flaws. The notion that the Hemet Maze Stone was constructed by the Chinese, on the other hand, faces more obstacles than must be overcome before the theory can be accepted. No irrefutable archaeological or historical evidence that the ancient Chinese were in the Americas before the Europeans has been discovered as yet. The Hemet Maystone is also made in a popular rock art style of Southern California. Because the Hemet Stone and other examples of similar rock art in the area lie so far inland, a somewhat large-sized community consisting of many outposts would be required. This suggests a long-term presence, and archaeologists may discover Chinese-style outposts, as well as Chinese material culture, dating back to the pre-Columbian period. In California, however, no Chinese colonies, monasteries, or material culture dating back before 1500 have been discovered. So far, only indigenous California cultural materials have been found with the rock art, such as the Hemet Maze Stone. Arrowheads, containers, mortars, and other Native American Stone Age tools have been discovered all across Southern California along with related rock art. The petroglyph was most likely made by indigenous Californians or other Native Americans, but future occupants may discover that the history of Eurasian travel in the Americas is more complicated than previously imagined. The Miami Circle, Florida the worst place to find an ancient mystery is on valuable real estate. That made it a battle to safeguard history from a developer's bulldozer. More historical places have been lost to construction in Florida than any other reason, which is why local historians say that when money talks, history walks. While removing an old structure in downtown Miami in 1998, a 38-foot diameter circular pattern of holes dug into limestone bedrock was discovered. It was one of the most significant finds in Florida archaeology. But there was a major stumbling block. It was located on a $10 million plot of land that could be worth 20 times that much if converted to make way for a new high-rise condominium. Located in the center of the city, south of the Miami River, the strange circle was estimated to have been built about 1,000 to 2,000 years ago by the Tequesta Indians, who had died out centuries before the Seminoles migrated into this area of the Florida Peninsula. Archaeologists from Miami-Dade County Historic Preservation Division examined the strange circle and determined the holes were used to support posts for a large round council house. The Brickle Point geological features were listed as part of Miami Circle. The circle has been linked with Atlantis as well as being a Bermuda Triangle corner marker. According to one theory, the pre-Columbian circle was part of a worldwide system of ancient circles that was linked to Stonehenge in some way. Others speculated it was a revered Mayan astronomical observatory used to track time. New Age historians, Indian shaman spiritualists, and stool children all wanted a glimpse of the ancient discovery or to feel its mystical properties. It was built on land originally owned by William Brickell, a pioneer who operated a trading post in his, the early 1800s. Brickell, instrumental in the founding of the city of Miami, had his remains reinterred in Woodland Park Cemetery 
by his family in 1946. The work of unearthing the old circle was not easy. Previously, the land included six two-story apartment buildings and a swimming pool, and the ground was littered with rusted plumbing pipes, steel reinforcement, concrete, and other garbage. After a lot of hard work, the modern relics were removed, revealing at least 200 more post holes in the limestone, in addition to the ones that formed the strange circle. A large animal carving cut into the stone was also revealed. A sea turtle, shark bone and teeth from an extinct monk seal, and the human, are all carved among the 24 rectangular basins. The most intriguing pieces were copper and galena bits, as well as two small axe heads constructed from materials not native to Florida. This suggests that the early people had a broad trading network 2,000 years ago. Archaeologists believe the site was used for ritual or ceremonial purposes based on the exotic subjects unearthed at the circle. The discovery of shark and turtle carcasses in what appeared to be a deliberate configuration, presumably for ceremonial purposes, strengthens this notion. In support of the hypothesis that the circle was constructed as a massive astronomical calendar or ancient almanac, surveyors found that the autumnal equinox, as well as the summer and winter solstices, may be predicted by solitary holes found 41 feet either side of the circular center. The idea that the circle was a Mayan project isn't so far-fetched when you consider how close the Yucatan Peninsula is to the tip of Florida, and the Mayans did build seagoing canoes. It would have been easy for Mayan mariners to ride the Gulf Stream over to Florida, though returning home might have been a problem. The Miami Circle was a fantastic archaeological find that merited more investigation, but it was impeding a multi-million dollar construction. The media hyped the activities, which drew so large a crowd that the area had to be walled off. A camera was put in the roof of a nearby high-rise, transmit pictures to the internet for people who couldn't make it to Miami, and there were 200 websites posting news on the Miami Circle. The 2,000-year-old circle had transformed into a kind of shrine attracting attention from all over the world. Maybe there was something magical about this circle after all. Save the Circle group staged candlelight vigils, and demonstrators marched with signs urging the property be saved from development. Thousands of emails were received, pleading for action from state and local officials to save the Circle. Experts even looked into the possibility of creating a massive plaster cast of the site, or slicing it into portions and transporting it to a safer location. Legislation sponsored in October 2003 would allow a feasibility assessment to be conducted on adding the prehistoric site into the Biscayne National Park. The 2.2-acre site was eventually seized by Miami-Dade County through the law of eminent domain and was later purchased for $26.7 million with a combination of funds from the State Conservation and Recreational Lands Program. The ancient people who once occupied the site could never have imagined the commotion the strange circle could cause 2,000 years later in downtown Miami, or that images of their work would flash around the world on the internet. Thanks to local contributions and a loan from the Trust for Public Land to preserve the site until more study can be done, the circle has been covered with gravel. Perhaps the strangest aspect of the Miami Circle case is how the ancient past has clashed with the present. Perhaps the ancients have set us a message in this circle. Now all we have to do is find out what it is. The Mysterious Blythe and Taglios, Blythe, California The Blythe and Taglios, often known as America's Nazca Lines, are a set of massive geoglyphs in the Colorado desert, just north of Blythe, California. There are around 600 intaglios, or anthropomorphic geoglyphs, in southwest United States alone, but the ones in Blythe are notable for their size and complexity. There are six figures in total spread across three locations on two mesas, all within a thousand feet of each other. Humans, animals, objects, and geometric shapes are all depicted in the geoglyphs, which can be viewed from the air. In November 1931, Army Air Corps pilot George Palmer discovered Blythe geoglyphs while flying from Hoover Dam to Los Angeles. His finding 
prompted a survey of the area, and the massive figures were designated as historical sites and dubbed giant desert figures. Due to lack of money during the Great Depression, additional investigation of the site would have to wait until the 1950s. National Geographic Society and the Smithsonian Institute sent a team of archaeologists to investigate the intaglios in 1952, and a story with aerial images appeared the September edition of National Geographic. It should be noted that some of the geoglyphs have evident tire damage as a result of the location being used for desert training during World War II. The geoglyphs needed to be restored and fences built to safeguard them from vandalism and harm. A state historic monument number 101, the Blythe and Taglios are now protected by two lines of fences and are open to the public at all times. Because geoglyphs are difficult to date, it's impossible to say when they were created, but they're thought to be between 450 and 2,000 years old. Some of the huge figures have been linked to 2,000-year-old cliff houses, which supports the latter theory. However, more recent research from the University of California, Berkeley, has placed them around the year 900 AD. The largest intaglio, reaching 171 feet, shows a male figure, or giant. A secondary figure of a male with a prominent phallus measures 102 feet from head to toe. The final human figure is oriented north-south with outstretched arms, outward pointing feet, and visible knees and elbows. From head to toe, it measures 105 and a half feet. A man with a spear, two fish below him, and a sun and snake above him are depicted in the fisherman glyph. It's the most contentious of the glyphs, as some claim it was carved in the 1930s, despite the fact the majority of people feel it's considerably older. Horses or mountain lions are said to be the animal figures. A rattlesnake's eyes are caught in the form of two rocks in the snake intaglio. It's 150 feet long, but has been destroyed over time by automobiles. Although there's no consensus on which tribes built the Blythe intaglios, or why, they are assumed to have been created by Native Americans who lived around the Colorado River. According to one theory, they were built by the Patean, who dominated the region from 700 until 1550 AD. According to Native Mojave and Quechan tribes in the area, the human figures symbolize Mastamo, the creator of the earth and all life, and the animal figures represent Hataculia, one of the two mountain lion people who had a role in the creation story. In ancient times, natives in the area performed ritual dances to worship the creator of life. The Blythe glyphs are, if nothing else, a manifestation of Native American art and a glimpse of the artistic ability of the time. The geoglyphs were created by scraping away at black desert stones to reveal brighter colored earth beneath. They created the submerged designs by stacking rocks, drawn away from the center, out around the outside margins of the symbols. Some speculate that these magnificent ground carvings were meant to be religious messages to ancestors or drawings to the gods. Indeed, these geoliths are inconspicuous from the ground and difficult, if not impossible, to decipher. The images become obvious only when viewed from above, which is how they were discovered in the first place. According to an archaeologist in the Bureau of Land Management in Yuma, Arizona, there isn't a single one where a person may stand on the hill and stare at a glyph in its entirety. The Blythe and Taglios are now considered to be among the largest of California's Native American drawings, and a chance of locating comparable concealed geoglyphs in the desert still exists. Enjoy exploring mysteries like this? Please hit that subscribe button and remember to tap the bell. The Mystery of Judicula Rock, Silva, North Carolina In the mountains of Jackson County, North Carolina, there is a gigantic enigmatic rock with petroglyphs that have yet to be interpreted. The rock holds great significance for the Cherokee Indians since it is said to date back over 3,000 years to a time before the Cherokee Indians inhabited the country. The location of the rock is a sacred spot where ancient ceremonies were held. The Cherokees gave it the name Judicula, which is a form of the name Tsulkwala, 
because they believed it was an ancient beast that ruled the mountains. Its name translates to He Has Them Slanting, or Slant-Eyed Giant, referring to a mighty person with superhuman abilities who could jump from mountain to mountain and even control the wind, rain, thunder, and lightning. The creature could transport regular humans to the spirit world and speak with them. It appears to be a godlike monster akin to those mentioned in mythology all around the world. Sukalu was said to be almost seven feet tall, with a horribly hairy body, seven digits on each hand and foot, all with claw-like finger and toenails. Tsukalu landed on the rock once and left a seven-fingered handprint on it. Strange sounds and UFO sightings during the night are among the many rumors and stories surrounding the mystery rock. A significant and powerful character in Cherokee mythology, Tsukalu was in charge of the weather, including the wind, rain, thunder, and lightning. The god also owned all the game in the mountains, and the Cherokee were only allowed to hunt with his permission. Tsukalu was deeply involved in the Cherokee people's lives. Enjoy exploring mysteries like this? Please hit that subscribe button and remember to tap the bell so you are notified when we put out new videos. The stone is a curvilinear shaped chunk of soapstone rock covered in nearly 1500 petroglyphs. The petroglyphs date from between 2000 and 3000 BCE and quarry tools were unearthed while digging around the stone. There were no other stones in the region with identical patterns which added to the mystery of the stone. It is found near the mountain's base where there's an abundance of metals and minerals to the point where electromagnetic interference is said to be detected. Unfortunately, Judicula Rock's hidden meanings will remain hidden for the time being. The historic site of Judicula Rock is owned and administered by Jackson County and is open every day until sunset. It is located in Chloe, North Carolina, and there's a visitor parking lot as well as a recently built viewing platform around the rock. There are numerous theories about the meaning of the petroglyphs on the rock. They range from maps to religious symbols with hidden messages to ancient people's graffiti. They could be animals, humans, or other important figures. A group of scientists recently employed laser-guided equipment to construct a precise image of the Judicula rock in order to analyze it. Unfortunately, because the original rock is exposed to the elements, weather has begun to corrode it, and the symbols will eventually fade away. If you have friends interested in historical mysteries, please share this video with them. It really helps us out a lot. The Mystery of Dighton Rock, Massachusetts in the fall of 1618, John Danza, with his freshly minted degree from Harvard College, visited the south shore of Massachusetts in Taunton and took a side trip to see one of the curiosities of the age, Dighton Rock. The rock, probably carved by American Indians, recorded a time when hostile ship arrived and fought with the local people. Danza recorded, and thus began, the mystery of Dighton Rock. There's been no solution to the mystery of Dighton Rock, but it has fascinated scholars, amateur archaeologists, and students of New England, Native American tribes, interest for centuries. The rock itself weighs 40 tons and is about 5 feet high, 11 feet long, and bears markings and inscriptions across one of its side. It has been interpreted more than 25 times and generated more than 35 theories as to what it means. It lay in the Taunton River in Dighton for more than 300 years, where it was partially submerged at high tide. Danza, who would later become a minister in Dorchester, helped popularize the rock with his brief description, which was forwarded to the Royal Society of London for its consideration. His drawing of the rock remains in collection of the British Museum today. The prolific Cotton Mather highlighted the rock in a sermon in 1689, which he later published as the wonderful works of God commemorating praises bespoke of the God of heaven in the Thanksgiving sermon, containing reflections upon the excellent things done by the great God. Mather didn't speculate of the specifics of the writing on the rock, but rather mentions them as writings from a previous era 
caused on a large rock no man alive knows how or when. However, among his other theories, Mather postulated that before the noble Puritans arrived in New England, a group of explorers had crossed from Europe and settled in America only to die miserably. The president of Yale declared the figures from the rock were Phoenician, deriving definitions mainly known for the seafaring in the Mediterranean, and managed to visit North America and left the writing as a calling card. This idea also gained traction in Europe as well. Receiving fresh attention among British and French historians, others concluded the markings were from Armenians who had made their way to America. Another camp, which has been trying to connect the origins of Native American tribes with Asia, proposed the characters were from explorers from Japan, China, or other parts of Asia. Later, in 1789, George Washington, while touring New England, thought the Dighton markings were left by American Indians. They were similar, he concluded, to Native American drawings he was familiar with in Virginia. The controversy was reignited when a Danish writer published his Antiquities Americani, which contained more than 40 pages of analysis of the Dighton Rock. Graphics included the markings on the rock. Almost no one else has been able to see the same thing, despite countless hours of study devoted to searching. In 1912, Edmund Burke Delabar laid new claim on the rock, arguing it was evidence of Portuguese discovery of America. The Brown University scholar lived somewhat near the rock for many years and had spent countless hours trying to interpret the writing. He concluded the inscription had been written by Portuguese explorer Miguel Corte Real, who had left Portugal in 1502 on exploratory voyage and was never heard from again. Delabar proposed that he had been heard from in the inscription on the rock that reads, I, Miguel Corte Real, 1511, in this place, by the will of God, I became chief of the Indians. In 1963, a group of preservationists finally wrested the rock from the riverbed and placed it in its own museum in Berkeley, Massachusetts, where it continues to inspire controversy. The Great Serpent Mound of Ohio The Great Serpent Mound the world's biggest surviving prehistoric effigy mound is a 1,300-foot-long, 3-foot-high prehistoric mound built on a plateau of a crater along Brush Creek in Adams County, Ohio. The mound, which resembles a coiled serpent, is shrouded in mystery and dispute. Despite more than a century of inquiry, there is no clear evidence concerning what it represents and what it was erected for. Various astronomical alignments indicate it may have served as a calendar. With its head approaching a cliff above the stream, the Serpent Mound adapts to the curve of the terrain on which it rests. It has seven unique coils that terminate in a triple coiled tail and spirals back and forth for over 800 feet. The Serpent Head features an open mouth that stretches around the east end of a 120 foot long hollow oval feature that is commonly interpreted as an egg, but alternate interpretations indicate it may be the body of a frog or simply a platform remnant. A triangular mound west of the effigy measures roughly 32 feet at its base. Thousands of years ago, the serpent mound is said to have been laid out all at once as a layer of clay and strengthened with stones. The Ohio countryside was dotted with mounds and enormous earthworks built by Native Americans. The building was formally attributed to the Adena culture, which flourished from 1000 BC to 100 AD. The Adena are famed for their burial and effigy mounds, several of which were discovered around the Great Serpent Mound. However, radiocarbon dating on bits of charcoal found within the Serpent Mound determined that work on the mound began around 1070 AD. As a result, the mound could have been constructed by the four ancient people who lived in the Ohio Valley from 1000 to 1550. Nonetheless, the research is inconclusive because it only confirms the presence of a 1,000-year-old charcoal within the mound. This could have been left there long after the effigy was constructed. The most widely held belief is that the serpent mound resembles a massive snake slowly uncoiling itself in order to grasp a massive egg with extended jaws. There are numerous additional theories that suggest diverse interpretations. 
Some speculate it could be a lunar eclipse or the phases of the moon. Others believe it resembles the horned serpent nest, which can be found in other various Native American tribes. Landon West, a local German Baptist clergyman, advanced another unique theory in 1909. As punishment for enticing Adam and Eve, the serpent was writhing in its dying throes. This was thought by West to be the original Garden of Eden. There are credible claims that the snake is inextricably linked to the skies. The snake has been cited as a model for the constellation known as the Little Dipper. It curled its tail around the North Star. The serpent's varied alignments match to astronomical phenomena such as the sun and moon alignments. The oval and region of the serpent are aligned to the summer solstice sunset, according to researchers, implying that one of the effigy's objectives was to mark the turning of the year so the planting, gathering, and hunting could be planned. It has been believed the curves of the effigy's body correspond to a set of six lunar alignments. If the serpent mound was built on both solar and lunar arrays, it would represent the unification of astronomical knowledge into a single emblem. The hypothesis that the serpent mound has astronomical significance has been supported by decades of academics. It's still a mystery who built the serpent and how it was used. Many scholars believe the serpent mound was used in religious ceremonies. When settlers first discovered the mound, there was a fire-scarred stone monument in the egg-shaped head, leading some to speculate that it was used as an altar of some sort, possibly sacrificial, based on a ceremonial knife. A number of skeleton heads were uncovered among the blackened stones in a nearby tomb. The serpent mound Whatever its true function attests to the cunning of its builders, the designer's brilliance is still visible. The Ohio Serpent Mound is one of the great iconic pictures of all human antiquity because of its blend of beauty, familiarity, abstraction, power, precision, and mystery. Abandoned Homes of Casa Grande, Arizona the purpose of one of the largest prehistoric buildings ever created in North America is a complete unknown. Archaeologists have unearthed evidence that the people who built the Casa Grande also created large-scale irrigation farming and substantial trade links that lasted for almost a thousand years, till around 1450 CE. The term Hohokam is given by archaeologists to a place with mud houses, red on buff pottery, and large canals. However, it is not the name of a tribe or people. Years of confusion have caused the Odom, Hopi, and Zuni people's forebears to be confused by the name Hohokam, which is neither a word in any of their languages nor the name of a distinct people. Around 1450, Casa Grande was abandoned by its builders. Because the original Sonoran Desert people had no written language, Recorded historical reports of Casa Grande begin with Pablo Esubio Francisco Quino's diary entries from his visit to the remains in 1694. He used the phrase Casa Grande, or Great House, in his description of the massive historical house lying before him, named still in use today. With the visits of Lieutenant Colonel Juan Batista de Ananza's expedition in 1775 and Brigadier General Stephen Kearney's military detachment in 1846, more information about the ruins became available. The public's interest in Casa Grande grew as a result of subsequent articles. During the late 1800s, more people began to visit the ruins. With the introduction of a railroad line 20 miles to the west, as well as connecting stagecoach route, which passed straight through Casa Grande, everything changed. Damaged, caused by souvenir hunters, graffiti, and open vandalism generated worries about the site's preservation. In 1883-84, anthropologist and historian Adolf Bandler examined Casa Grande ruins, commenting on its state and potential significance. The Hemingway Southwestern Archaeological Expedition of 1887-88, conducted by anthropologist Frank H. Cushing and supported by Massachusetts philanthropist Mary Hemingway, provided more information on the site's deterioration. As a result, 
prominent Bostonians persuaded Massachusetts Senator George F. Hoare to submit a petition to the United States Senate in 1889, urging the government to rebuild and conserve the ruins. If you have friends interested in historical mysteries, please share this video with them. Repair work began the following year and in 1892, President Benjamin Harrison established the first prehistoric and cultural reserve in the United States, setting aside one square mile of Arizona territory surrounding the Casa Grande ruins. In 1901, the General Land Office took over the ruins and young Frank Pinkley was first on-site keeper. In 1903, a corrugated iron shelter roof, supported by redwood timbers, was built over the Casa Grande ruins, and between 1906 and 1908, extensive excavations and repairs of the ruins were carried out under supervision of the Bureau of Ethnology. At that time, the majority of the lower walls visible today were exposed. In August 1918, President Woodward Wilson declared the Casa Grande ruins a national monument, and control of the ruins was handed over to the National Park Service. Frank Pinkley remained as keeper and became superintendent of all Southwestern monuments. From 1926 to 1930, he hosted the yearly Arizona pageant and produced a wide range of publications about the Casa Grande ruins as part of his promotional efforts. During the 1930s, a number of significant construction projects were conducted. Between 1932 and 1937, the major component of the tourist center structure, along with the neighboring parking area and entrance road, as well as the new steel shelter roof over Casa Grande, were built. The Civilian Conservation Corps built a number of adobe structures to support park operations in 1940. These structures are all still in use today and have been included to the National Register of Historic Places. As a result, Casa Grande's physical look has remained relatively unchanged since the 1940s. Research is still going on. Ruins repairs, interpretive programs, and visitor center remodeling are all part of a continuous effort to provide the best visitor experience possible and to fulfill the National Park Service mission to protect preserve and make available for present and future generations the many wonders of the Casa Grande ruins. America's Stonehenge, Salem, New Hampshire. What looks to be America's greatest and maybe oldest megalithic conundrum is located 40 miles north of Boston, 25 miles inland from the Atlantic Ocean. For more than a century, archaeologists have pondered over Mystery Hill sometimes known as America's Stonehenge. A succession of low walls, cave-like rudimentary dwellings, and tunnels are strewn across 30 acres of hillside in a gigantic chaos of juvenile disorder, deep cunning, and rough naivety, according to one archaeologist. While the hills compared to England's Stonehenge circle, it is physically extremely distinct at first appearance. Stonehenge is arranged perfectly as a sequence of concentric rings, horseshoes, and squares on a plain, not a hill. By comparison, Mystery Hill appears to be a muddle. The stones used in Stonehenge are up to 45 tons in weight. Mystery Hill stones are smaller. The largest weighs roughly 11 tons and has a simpler design. However, there are some similarities between the two sites. They were both originally used as observatories there are astronomical alignments in each, including the summer solstice. Second, we know nearly nothing about either location's constructors. While we don't know what kind of ceremonies may have taken place at Stonehenge, we do know more about the activities on Mystery Hill. One of the site's most prominent characteristics is a massive flat stone that looks like a large table and stands on four legs. A groove runs round the table's edge, leading to a spout massive slab has been dubbed the sacrificial stone and it very well could have served that purpose. The gutter was most likely there to allow the sacrificed blood to drain off the top. A shaft, eight feet long, leads to an underground chamber beneath the sacrificed stone. It seems reasonable a priest in the chamber was allowed to speak 
to a crowd assembled around the altar as the voice of an oracle floating up from the sacrificial stone. The site features a variety of man-made tunnels and passages in addition to the oracle chamber and the sacrifice stone. At least one seems to have been built with a drain to prevent flooding. The hill's recent history can be traced back to Jonathan Patti, a farmer who lived atop the hill in the early 1800s. Patti is said to have been a thief, running illicit still, and was a stop in the infamous Underground Railroad, which transported escaped slaves from the south to safety. One thing is certain, Patti's farmhouse had a cellar in one of the structures. Patti was said to have built the structures with the help of his five sons. Seems unlikely, though, as one of the site's stones was discovered interlocked with the stump of a tree which began growing in 1769, long before Patty arrived in the area. William Lee Goodwin brought the property in 1936. The structures atop the hill, according to Goodwin, were built by Irish monks who crossed the Atlantic centuries before Columbus. Goodwin did his own archaeology on the site, deleting any material that contradicted his theory. The loss of these objects is one of the reasons for the hill's profound mystery. The stone was not built by Native Americans who lived in the Northeast before the Europeans came. Colonial farmers didn't arrive in the valley till 1730, and we know from the stump interlocked with stone that construction must have begun before 1769. 39 years seems like a short time to construct such a set of structures. The sacrificial stone oracle doesn't seem to fit with the colonists' religious beliefs. Testing of ceramic fragrance has revealed that they date back to 1000 BCE. Radiocarbon dating revealed the charcoal from one fire pit was 4,000 years old. The site is currently maintained by America's Stonehenge Foundation and is open to the public. It appears likely the site was built in ancient times by individuals we know nothing about. Some speculate the plot is tied up to Mediterranean cultures, such as Greek or Phoenician. There's a surprising resemblance between the Oracle and Mystery Hill's structure and those of ancient temples in Malta and Greece. It's possible we'll never know who constructed this site and we'll never figure out how to use the astronomical data included in its alignments. It is certain we'll never know what the Oracle's voice said and we'll never know what or who was sacrificed on this hard, cold stone altar. Berkeley Mystery Walls, San Francisco, California. The Great Wall of California is a term used to describe the old Berkeley fortifications, which are still a mystery. It is still unknown who built the stone walls or why they were built. Could this have been evidence of unknown advanced culture settling in the East Bay in the past? The ancient walls run about 50 miles along East Bay from Berkeley to San Jose. 50 mile long wall is strange enough, but what if it's not alone? What if there was a chain of barriers across the length of Northern California? There are more mystery barriers across the area, not just in the San Francisco Bay. As it turns out, instead, the barriers might go all the way to the Oregon border. The walls continue inland towards Mount Diablo after meandering through Oakland Hills, where we come to a mystery stone circle with a diameter of 30 feet. The walls form a 200-foot wide spiral that encircles a big boulder in one location. Some researchers who studied the ancient remains speculated the stone walls were built by Mongolian settlers, as the Chinese had a habit of erecting walls around their cities. Perhaps this mysterious wall was modeled after China's Great Wall. The Chinese are a popular choice among some because of the popularity of the idea among fringe theorists that the Chinese Admiral Zheng He made it to California and made have established a settlement. Another more extraordinary suggestion is that it was built either by the Lemurians or refugees from Mu. Enjoy exploring mysteries like this? Please hit that subscribe button and remember to tap the bell so you are notified when we put out new videos. Is it possible that the Byzantine feet that set out to round the globe made it to California? Anchors discovered in Baja California, mysterious writings from a Buddhist monk found in Mesoamerica, 
and 17th century junk discovered near Chico all point to the presence of the Chinese adventurer in this region. Others believe they were built by early missionaries, while still others question if Sir Francis Drake didn't leave colonists behind at the place where he concluded his trip round the world. Although the Alone Indians were hunter-gatherers and are not known to have built permanent structures, some people believe they were the builders. However, like with the other theories, there's little evidence to support this one. The builders of the Great Wall of California's identities has remained a mystery. Many of the stones are large and heavy, and the site appears to be fairly old. The wall stands up to five feet tall in sections and is made up of rocks of various sizes. Some of the blocks are the size of basketballs, while others are massive sandstone rocks that weigh a ton or more. Many of the formations have sunk deep into the ground and are frequently overgrown with the surrounding vegetation. At first glance, this appears to be some sort of defense structure. There are certain issues with this theory, though. The wall does not run full length and is made up of several portions. Furthermore, the wall is not tall enough to have served as a defensive barrier. As a result, it's improbable that it was employed as a fence. So why was it constructed? Unfortunately, the wall has never undergone thorough scientific assessment. Archaeologists and scientists have not delved more into its mysterious and fascinating side. The ancient Berkeley walls will have to remain an unsolved North American mystery for the time being. The Mystery of the Bighorn Medicine Wheel Shared in Wyoming The centuries-old medicine wheel, as it is now known, is positioned high in the Bighorn Mountains of northern Wyoming and appears to be a monument to astronomical applications employed by people who lived in the northern plains long before white men or even the Crow Indians arrived. The wheel, which is over 10,000 feet above sea level near Medicine Mountains Peak, is usually only accessible by humans during the summer months. The Medicine Wheel has a diameter of 80 feet and a circumference of 245 feet and is thought to be made of stone collected from around the monument. With stone stacked inside to construct a core, donut-shaped cairn measuring 12 feet in diameter and 2 feet tall, the central cairn connects 28 stone spokes into an outside circle, and around the circle there are six more stone cairns, some of which are large enough for a person to sit in. The six cairns that surround the wheel are unmistakably linked to the night sky. The 28 spokes most likely represent the 28-day moon cycle, but the number 28 also appears to fit to another piece of astronomical puzzle. When two of the cairns are aligned with the center, they can be used to indicate the rising and setting of the summer solstice. At one cairn and looking towards another, you will be directed to numerous spots in the distant horizon. On summer solstice, these points illustrate where the sun rises or sets, as well as where helically rising stars first rise at dawn after being hidden by the sun. The morning stars are employed to forecast the arrival of the Earth's ceremonial days. The area is snow-free for only two months of the year, during summer solstice. The day a star can be first seen shortly after dawn, after being behind the sun for an entire season, is known as the helical rising of the star, which pinpoints the matching date for stars in these observations. From around 1200 to 1700 AD, these stars would have served as solstice markers for Native Americans. Formalt would rise 28 days before summer solstice, Aldebaran would rise during the two days leading up to solstice, Rigel would rise 28 days after solstice, and Sirius 28 days after that, at the end of August, signifying the end of summer and time to leave the mountain. Bighorn Medicine Wheel's origins are uncertain, although the star alignments with the cairns were at their most accurate about 1280. The solstice alignments are still accurate today despite minor fluctuations in the Earth's orbit. The wheel was where the crow first arrived in 1680, therefore its age is known. A Crow leader, after completing vision quest on the spot, realized they had found their homeland. 
The Bighorn Wheel is part of a larger archaeological complex which spans 7,000 years of Native American adaptation to and utilization of the alpine region that surrounds Medicine Mountain. Nearby, there are a number of current American Indian ceremonial staging spaces, medicinal and ceremonial plant gathering regions, sweat lodge sites, altar offering locales, and fasting or vision quest enclosures. The Medicine Wheel and surrounding environment are one of the most important and well-preserved ancient Native American holy site complexes in North America, according to ethno-historic, anthropological, and archaeological evidence. In South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, between 70 and 150 wheels have been discovered. Plains Indians likely built the wheel between 300 and 800 years ago and it has been used and maintained by many groups since then. The earliest component is the central cairn, which extends below the wheel and has been buried by wind-blown dust. It could have been used to support a center pole. During Native American ceremonies, a bison skull is frequently put atop this center cairn. While some crow believed the wheel was created before the light, Others believe that it was dropped from the heavens by God. Some claim it was built by the Sheep Eater, a Shoshone tribe whose name comes from their skill in hunting mountain sheep. Many Crow believe it is a manual for erecting teepees. A man named Scarface is mentioned in one Crow myth. He was attractive and enjoyed flaunting around in his finery in front of young women. He slipped in the fire one day while entering his mother's teepee severely burning his face and making him embarrassed to be seen. He left his people, ashamed of his appearance, and went to dwell in the mountains. Scarface was a loner for a long time. One day, a young woman and her grandmother got separated from their people while hunting berries, couldn't find their way back. They followed a track that led them into the mountains. Scarface was periodically seen by them, and they had made touch with him. Scarface eventually married the young lady. He is said to have created the medicine wheel as a refuge on their way back to his tribe. He built another teepee by the Bighorn River in the valley below on the second day. These teepee rings are thought to still be in existence. The medicine wheel was also supposed to have provided excellent spiritual medicine to Red Plume, a prominent Crow chief during the time of Lewis and Clark. According to folklore, Red Plume was visited by little beings who lived in the passage to the wheel. They led him into the dirt, telling him that the red eagle feathers were his powerful medicine guide and protector, and he was instructed to wear the little eagle feather on the back of his head over the tail feathers at all times. As a result, Red Plume was given his name. On his deathbed, he assured his family that his spirit could be discovered at the medicine wheel, where they could connect with him. However, whoever wrecked the medicine wheel left no clue to what it was used for. New Age religionists and Native Americans alike are drawn to the Medicine Wheel site for ceremonial purposes today. In 1969, the Bighorn Medicine Wheel was placed on the National Register of Historic Places, and the site was recently extended and designated as Medicine Wheel, Medicine Mountain, National Historic Landmark. There are other significant Native American holy ground on another 4,000 acres, some of which are still intact. Medicine Mountain was also very significant from a geological standpoint. There are 10 spots on Earth that are known as continental nuclei, or tiny patches of some of the world's oldest rocks. These old Earth portions were initially the surface of the planet's crust two or three billion years ago, and younger rock which covered them has since eroded away. Sometimes called continental roots, these rocks were once part of the Gondwana land supercontinent, which began to break apart 300 million years ago. Between 65 million and 1 million years ago, it split into the continents we know. These continents are still drifting today. The layers of time exposed at Medicine Mountain, however, are laid bare for the open eye to see, with the medicine wheel effectively floating on some of the Earth's oldest surface stone. A nearly 360 degree picture reveals a gradual geological march downward from Medicine Mountain summit to the fresh earth and stone that lies under on the valley floors. 
The Bighorn Medicine Wheel is the best example of countless medicine wheels spread over the American West and Canada. To go to the wheel, you'll travel west from Lago, Wyoming. The trek up Bighorn Range extraordinary western slope is made possible by amazing sequence of switchbacks that snake their way up the mountain. Parking is accessible near the wheel at a visitor center. The walk from the visitor center to the site is about a mile. However, handicapped guests can drive straight up to the wheel. From October through May, the roads are normally blocked, so plan your visit accordingly and connect with your spiritual self at Wyoming's Medicine Wheel. Some world phenomena are difficult to explain using our existing technology or collection of knowledge. It's possible that some of these unsolved mysteries will become clearer as science progresses, but other unsolved mysteries will undoubtedly become murkier over time as critical information is lost or buried with those who once knew. Some mysteries defy explanation and might appear to exist independently of what was previously known or what technology might have found in the future. We're both uncomfortable with the loose ends, but we're in love, and maybe even obsessed, at the same time. <laughs>